We're going to continue on in our series in 1 Peter. Today we'll be looking at chapter 2, verse 4 to 8. Last week, however, we were looking at 1 Peter 1, and there we uh, came to realize that we actually, as people, move from the natural life to a spiritual life. And God's purpose, of course, not to make us happy or physically healthy, but to actually make us holy. And so last week we came to understand that God is in the process of making you and I holy. Say that word with me, holy. So what is holy? What does it mean to be made holy? It's to be like Jesus. It's to be made perfect. It is to be people who are set apart. It is for people to be different, not in an awkward way, but in a very peculiar way, as God's Word even says. Holiness rests on the ability of God in guarding our souls because God's purpose, despite worldly or satanic opposition, is to cause people to become more like Jesus each and every day. And that's what he has taken us through, is this, this process of being made holy. And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24 says this, as we move from corruptible to incorruptible, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That's what we looked at last week. Today we're going to be working on us. I'm going to have you stand for a minute. And we're going to do some jumping jacks. And so we're going, to do, uh, we're going to do some working on us. And that's what this is all about. So the title of today's message is Working on Me. And so there's two things that are going on when we're being worked on. One, someone is working on us. And that is God himself. Two, you're working on you. And so often in life what happens is we spend so much of our time working on changing other people rather than letting God be at work in our lives and we spend some time changing us. Okay, so when's the last time you've done some jumping jacks? Are we going to have some pulled muscles here? Probably, all right, I'm not going to make you do that, all right? But I want you to come to understand that today I need you to take this. This is a takeaway. We're working on me. Say that. Working on me. One more time. Working on me. You may be seated. So God is working on us, and I want you to work on you. I want you to work on you just like I'm working on myself. And what does it mean to work on ourselves? We have to actually look and see what is working in our lives. Last week I asked you to write down some positive things about your life. And these books that you've been given, and the men come Father's Day, you're going to receive some of these wonderful books as well. But many of you women were given these books from the church at Mother's Day. How many of you brought them today? There's a few. All right. Well, many of you should be bringing it. You know why we gave you those books? Is to write in them. You remember how to write? Do you remember what a pen and paper is? And I know that we're living in a digital world today. And so maybe you want to bring your, your handheld device and you can, you can write some things you know, on your phone or whatever too, but you can do that. But sometimes we like to go old school, and I'm a little bit old school in that way, so write some things down. What are the positive things that have happened in your life since you've come to know Jesus? That's what I want you to write down. So if you haven't done it yet, today you're going to do it. And so I'm hoping that if you didn't bring something to write down on paper and pen today, you're going to do this at home. But what is the transformation that has happened in your life? And some of you, I want you to shout that out right now. How has God changed you since coming to know Jesus? How are you better is what I'm asking. Just shout out a few things about yourself. You don't smoke anymore. A lot of the worldly things have changed, fallen off. Has given you a peace that's unexplainable. Who else? How has God changed you? You're kinder. I am so glad you're kinder. (laughs) 
What else? I won't make fun of you. He changed you from the inside out. You're not the same person. How else has God transformed you? What does that look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Less fearful. Less fearful. Yes. Happier. Happier. Absolutely. Love people more now than you ever did before. I knew a man before coming to know Jesus. He was a truck driver, by the way. And I love truck drivers. As you know, I was a heavy duty for a lot of years. And so I have a heart for the trucking industry. He couldn't even look at people before coming to know Jesus. He was angry at every single person. Everybody. Always angry. And then he has an encounter with Jesus. And it isn't long. And all of a sudden, he's doing everything in his power to help people. That's how God transformed him. Went from a man who hated people to a man who now loved people. That's the transformation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I say to you today that you need to work on who you are, I want you to write down how God has changed you. How has he truly transformed you? So we're working on us today. We're looking at 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5, and that's where we're going to start. We're actually going to go to verse 8 today. But here we see that Peter teaches us the importance of obeying the Spirit of God within us. So when you come to faith in Jesus, you have an encounter with the Lord immediately. His Holy Spirit is at work in you. And it's in that moment you need to listen, is what Peter is saying, to the the working of the Holy Spirit that is in your life. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5 says, As you come to him, this is to Jesus, the living stone, remember that he was rejected by humans but chosen by God and is precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. So what is Peter saying here? He is giving us a contrast. He's telling us the difference between the physical aspect of bringing sacrifices to the stone temple of Jerusalem and the inner spiritual temple of being born again believers who are now making sacrifices spiritually because they've died spiritually. And he's giving us that contrast. So he's helping these Christians Work on themselves. Work on what it means to be holy. You see, God can make us holy, but we play a part in it. So he makes our spirit holy, and we have nothing to do with that. We can't do anything about that. That is God's work, and it is his perfection at work that makes our spirit holy. But when we come to faith in Jesus, our spirit has died. That old spirit that was dead is gone. And now your spirit has been raised anew, is what Peter is saying. It's been raised anew. And your spirit is perfect. And you need to know that. And I need you to write that in your books. My spirit is perfect. It has been made holy. It's positionally changed. That's what's happened. It was once dead and unholy, ungodly. It is now godly, holy, and alive. Oh, this should be bringing joy to your soul because now your joy is going to experience what your spirit has encountered. And so when your spirit is renewed, all of a sudden your soul, it begins to thrive. It begins to, to cry out and says, I want some of that. <laughs> Just like that truck driver. His spirit was dead and all he, his soul was doing was hating people. But when his spirit was made new, his soul started noticing people. Started noticing. It's like the soul has eyes. It's like the soul has ears. It's like the soul has these, these senses of taste and touch and smell. It's amazing how the soul all of a sudden gets stimulated when the spirit has been re remade, made new in Jesus. And this is what Peter is saying. He says that God is living in you God lives in you. And some of you today, you're saying, I doubt that. Oh, no, he does. Doubt it if you've never received Jesus, sure. 
But if you've received Jesus, don't doubt it. Believe it. He lives in you. Ephesians 2, 19-22 says, Consequently, now that you know Jesus, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God lives in you. I promise you that. Do you know why I promise you that? Because the Bible tells me so. It tells me so. And I stand on the promises of God. And the Bible says that God lives in you when you receive Jesus into your life because Jesus is the true, the way, and the life. And only through Jesus can we come to the Father in heaven. He is with you. And you might be having some dark days and dark moments in your life, but you need to know that Jesus is with you. He's always been there. You know, in the Old Testament, they were offering up sacrifices, bulls, goats, rams. They were offering all this to God in the lifeless stone temple of Jerusalem as one was done before Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That was the system. But today, we can offer our thoughts, our soul, our words, our actions, our will to the one who dwells in the soul and mind as a sacrifice. And that's what Peter is saying today. That's the, that's the contrast that he is making today is that we don't offer up these external things anymore. We offer up what's inside of us. What is in your soul is what you offer up to God. And by doing so, the Holy Spirit can effectively minister to your soul, which then touches your body and your mind in a holistic way. You know, when you bring things to God that are on your soul, you start healing in your body. Did you know that? It's amazing how the body starts to thrive when the soul is healthy. Not in every case, but in many. See, there's a human deficiency at work. I want to talk about this for a moment. The deficiency that human beings have is that Jesus Christ was rejected by finite human beings, which leads many people to choose false paths in seeking holiness, causing lives to crumble with false hope. And there are reasons that we default to reject Jesus. For example, there's this thing called inherited sin from Adam. In other words, we were born into a sinful world. And I know that we live in a culture today that wants to say otherwise. It wants to say, no, that we weren't. But we were. Why do I know that? And why am I telling you that today? Because the Bible tells me so. And today the Bible is being challenged. And what that means is human beings are challenging the supernatural. They're challenging God. Reasons that we default to reject Jesus, we've inherited sin from Adam. We have a sinful nature because of it. And we also have an enemy, Satan, who blinds us, who has this veil of darkness upon many people. But thankfully, an infinite God chose Jesus to become the chief cornerstone on which we are to build our lives upon. And this cornerstone that I'm talking about, and if anybody here is is, is a builder, you will know how important it is to start square and straight. Because if you don't start square and straight, everything from there becomes crooked and nothing lines up. And so what Jesus is to us is a sure foundation. He is perfect. He is straight. He is in alignment. And everything that we build upon Jesus is going to actually be perfect as it moves out from the cornerstone. And that's what Peter is telling those good Christians and that God is telling us today is that Jesus is our foundation And 1 Peter 2, verses 6 to 8 tells us, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a a chosen and precious cornerstone, 
and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. You know, Peter references the prophetic Old Testament scripture here. Isaiah 28, 16. That's what he is really bringing forward in this passage. And he brings it forward as the principal truth of the unique position of Christ as the chief cornerstone of God's new habitation in the heart, in the soul and mind of those who believe in him as foreseen and foreordained. In other words, this was not an afterthought or new idea speaking into our conscious being, giving us confidence to believe God is big enough to save us from death as he makes us holy, has always been God's plan. It's always been his plan. So they move from external to internal. But we have a choice, don't we? And Peter said it here. People have a choice. You know, isn't it amazing that God gave us free will? Do you like free will? Do you? Yes or no? Yeah. What do you like about it? You love your choices. And during COVID, guess what? Many of our choices diminished. How many choices did we have before COVID that we no longer had during COVID? And guess what? Because of free will, we got mad. (laughs) We got mad because we had to do it differently or I didn't have the choices that I once did. And that's human. And that's part of the deficiency of having that that sinful nature is that when we don't get it our way, we get upset and we get mad and we get frustrated. And next thing you know it, we're not looking so holy anymore. (laughs) That witness that we are of of a person in relationship with a holy God starts not looking so well. But we like our choices. I love having choices. I love looking for something to eat and seeing, oh, I got Wendy's to choose from today. Maybe I can go to Starbucks. Hey, there's Tim Hortons over there. And then over there's McDonald's. And then there's a Burger King. And then there's A&W. Then there's Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, man, what else is there? The Burger Baron. All kinds of stuff to choose from. What do I choose? I want to choose them all. I just want to go through them all. But my stomach's appetite is bigger than... It really is, you know. What do they say? My eyes are bigger than I can actually eat. Thank you. My eyes are bigger than my stomach. Thank you. You're tracking. Choices are great. Free will is awesome. But we can abuse it. And we can also use it to condemn ourselves. And that's what the Bible says. And why do I tell you this? Because I believe in the Bible. I believe that God's word is the Bible, inspired, given to us so that we might know what the Father in heaven would say to his sons and his daughters. And anyone building their spiritual house on Jesus as the chief cornerstone will never regret standing on these promises. But anyone who fails to trust Jesus will be put to shame when they stand before God and realize in full that they've rejected the truth. The Bible says that every knee shall bow before Jesus one day. Every knee shall bow. And you will either do it willingly or you will do it wishing you had done it willingly. And that's the warning, the stern warning that the Bible gives us. And I hate having to talk about these things. But I have to tell you of the whole of of the Bible, not just the parts, but all of it. We will all stand before God one day, and we, we will either willingly bow, or we will bow because we are in the presence of the Almighty God. And His power will just simply make us bow. And the Bible tells us that the cornerstone was the most significant stone in the structure that Jesus was. In 2 Corinthians 2.16 says, To the one, we are the smell of death, and to the other, we are the fragrance of life. Who is Jesus to you today? Is he the smell of death? Or is he the fragrance of life? 
You know, condemnation is not from God. I want to read this to you. Do you have your Bibles with you? Would you turn to John three sixteen to 18? It's in the New Testament for those that might not know, which is toward the more the end of the Bible. And I love telling people to start reading in John if they've never read in the Bible because it talks about Jesus and his life and who he was becoming, coming to earth. He, it was, it, you know, if I could just read through some of this for you, you would just be blessed. I don't have all day to do that, but I want to read something to you. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that God doesn't condemn you. I want you to know that he has given you free will, but with our free will, we will either choose to thrive in life or we will condemn ourselves. And John three sixteen to 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you want eternal life? To be in the presence of God forevermore? To be with the saints who got there before you? Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> why, why are they there before me? Verse 17, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent Jesus in the world to save the world through him. Now listen to verse 18. This is the heart of God. He gave us free will, remember. Whoever believes in him with that free will, you don't have to believe in him. You don't have to live by the authority of the Bible. You can live like hell on earth if you want. Go ahead. You have free will. You can break all the rules all the laws. You can do whatever you want. You can take people's lives. You can steal. You can rape. You can pillage. You can do all that. Go ahead. God gave you free will. Go ahead and live that way. I'm not going to stand here and tell you not to. But I will tell you there will be consequences. There will be consequences for that kind of life. But God loves you. And says, whoever believes in him isn't condemned. He doesn't condemn us. <laughs> but whoever doesn't believe stands condemned. They stand condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict in verse 19. Light has come into the world. And who is that light? That's Jesus. But men loved their darkness. They loved living like hell on earth. They want to be their own God. They want no one to tell them how to live their life. And this is the verdict. The light came into the world, but we loved our darkness instead of light, and our deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. How do you want your life to end? In Jesus. I want my life to end better than it began. I was born into a sinful world, is what the Bible tells me. And then I came to faith in Jesus after many years of living as a very rebellious person. And a rebellious person is someone who is godless, really. They don't want God to tell them how to live their life. Oh, I had free will just like you all have free will. And with my free will, I did some things that cost me some pain. The consequences. But I said to myself, well, I'll, if I get caught, that's fine. I'll pay them then. And then when I did get caught in these sins, the consequences were harder than I ever thought they would be to have to live through. And so God says that our deeds will be exposed by what? The light. Because God's love is here. It's here in the world. And it exposes the darkness. God loves you so much. And with our will, we have a choice. And with it, I eventually came to choose Jesus. And I think he was in pretty hot pursuit of me. What do you think? Theologically speaking, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. He is in hot pursuit of you. So Jesus is precious. 
He is precious. Jesus is one thing to those who put their trust and faith in God, and that is precious. Is Jesus precious to you today? A precious value to those who believe Jesus is precious because he can lift our burden of sin and death, and he can forgive us of our past. And I have a memory now that is forgetting things. I have done some things that I said to myself in those days that I did those things. God, take this from my memory. And you know what? I can't remember those things that I did anymore. Oh, I love it. I don't know if it's just that I'm getting older and I'm starting to forget. I think there's something supernatural going on. He is helping me to forget those trespasses so that I might be able to move on. So that I might be able to move on lighter than ever before. And when we trust in God by receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, we become a stone in this significant structure called the temple. We have become a part of the body of Jesus. We have become a part of the temple of God that is living, breathing, and active. It's not a cold stone made of brick, but a living stone in keeping with Christ the cornerstone. That is what we have become when we have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Does God love you? Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us. We thank you that you gave us life when we deserved death. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the cornerstone and that when we build our life on your foundation, it is going to be perfect. And Father, at times we wonder, how does this even look perfect? But we know that our efforts will not be in vain. We know that the outcome will be better. And we thank you for the transformation that has happened in our lives. Where we once hated people, we now love them. Where there was hate, there is now love. Where there was greed, there is now a willingness to give. Oh, Lord, these are some of the things that you've done. And there's so much more. We just want to thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You're going to have a great week ahead of you. I know you are. I need you to write down those things that God has changed in you over the years that you have come to know him. And maybe you're just coming to know him now. And maybe you don't even know him. I want you to write down who you are and then look back on it a year or two and see how he has changed you. Would you do that? Because he is in the work of transforming lives. God bless you. God keep you. Have a great week until we meet again. Amen.